Chapter 14 The Word of Knowledge and Faith To another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 8 and 9 We have not passed this way hitherto. I believe that Satan has many devices, and that they are worse today than ever before. But I also believe that there is to be a full manifestation on the earth of the power and glory of God to defeat every device of Satan. In Ephesians 4, we are told to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all. The baptism of the Spirit is to make us all one. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 that by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. It is God's thought that we speak the same thing. If we all have the same revelation of the Spirit of God, we shall all see the same thing. Paul asked these Corinthians, Is Christ divided? When the Holy Ghost has full control, Christ is never divided. His body is not divided. There is no division. Schism and division are the products of the carnal mind. How important it is that we shall have the manifestation of the word of knowledge in our midst. It is the same Spirit who brings forth the word of wisdom that brings forth the word of knowledge. The revelation of the mysteries of God comes by the Spirit, and we must have a supernatural word of knowledge in order to convey to others the things which the Spirit of God has revealed. The Spirit of God reveals Christ in all His wonderful fullness, and He shows Him to us from the beginning to the end of the Scriptures. It is the Scriptures that make us wise unto salvation, that open to us the depths of the kingdom of heaven, which reveal all the divine mind to us. There are thousands of people who read and study the Word of God, but it is not quickened to them. The Bible is a dead letter except by the Spirit. The Word of God can never be vital and powerful in us except by the Spirit. The words that Christ spoke were not just dead words, but they were spirit and life. And so it is the thought of God that a living word, a word of truth, a word of God, a supernatural word of knowledge shall come forth from us through the power of the Spirit of God. It is the Holy Ghost who will bring forth utterances from our lips and a divine revelation of all the mind of God. The child of God ought to thirst for the word and should know nothing among men save Jesus. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It is as we feed on the word and meditate on the message it contains that the Spirit of God can vitalize that which we have received and bring forth through us the word of knowledge that will be as full of power and life, as when he, the Spirit of God, moved upon the holy men of old and gave them these inspired scriptures. They were all in breathed of God as they came forth at the beginning, and through the same Spirit they should come forth from us vitalized, living, powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. With the gifts of the Spirit should come the fruit of the Spirit. With wisdom we should have love, with knowledge we should have joy, and with the third gift, faith, we should have the fruit of peace. Faith always rests. Faith laughs at impossibilities. Salvation is by faith, through grace, and it is the gift of God. We are kept by the power of God through faith. God gives faith, and nothing can take it away. By faith we have power to enter into the wonderful things of God. There are three positions of faith. Saving faith, which is the gift of God, the faith of the Lord Jesus, and the gift of faith. You will remember the word of the Lord Jesus Christ given to Paul, to which he refers in the 26th of Acts, where the Lord commissioned him to go to the Gentiles, to open their eyes, and to turn them from darkness into light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Oh, this wonderful faith of the Lord Jesus! Your faith comes to an end! How many times I have been to the place where I have had to tell the Lord, I have used all the faith I have, and then he has placed his own faith within me. One of our workers said to me at Christmas time, Wigglesworth, I was never so near the end of my purse in my life. I replied, Thank God, you are just at the opening of God's treasures. It is when we are at the end of our own that we can enter into the ridges of God's resources. It is when we possess nothing that we can possess all things. The Lord will always meet you when you are on the line of living faith. I was in Ireland at one time and went to a house and said to the lady who came to the door, Is Brother Wallace here? She replied, Oh, he has gone to Bangor, but God has sent you here for me. I need you. Come in. She told me her husband was a deacon at the Presbyterian Church. 
She had herself received the baptism while she was a member of the Presbyterian Church, but they did not accept it as from God. The people of the church said to her husband, This thing cannot go on. We don't want you to be a deacon any longer, and your wife is not wanted in the church. The man was very enraged, and he became incensed against his wife. Seems as though an evil spirit possessed him, and the home that had once been peaceful became very terrible. At last he left home and left no money behind him, and the woman asked me what should she do. We went to prayer, and before we had prayed five minutes, the woman was mightily filled with the Holy Ghost. I said to her, Sit down and let me talk to you. Are you often in the Spirit like this? She said, Yes, and what could I do without the Holy Ghost now? I said to her, The situation is yours. The Word of God says that you have the power to sanctify your husband. Dare to believe the Word of God. Now the first thing we must do is to pray that your husband come back tonight. She said, I know he won't. I said, If we agree together, it is done. She said, I will agree. And I said to her, when he comes home, show him all possible love. Lavish everything upon him. If he won't hear what you have to say, let him go to bed. The situation is yours. Get down before God and claim him for the Lord. Get into the glory just as you have got in today. And as the Spirit of God prays through you, you will find that God will grant all the desires of your heart. A month later, I saw this sister at a convention. She told how her husband came home that night and that he went to bed. But she prayed right through to victory and then laid her hands upon him. The moment she laid hands upon him, he cried out for mercy. The Lord saved him and baptized him in the Holy Spirit. The power of God is beyond all our conception. The trouble is that we do not have the power of God in a full manifestation because of our finite thoughts. But as we go on and let God have his way, there is no limit to what our limitless God will do in response to a limitless faith. But you will never get anywhere except you are in constant pursuit of all the power of God. One day when I came home from our open air meeting at 11 o'clock, I found that my wife was out. I asked, where is she? I was told that she was down at Mitchell's. I had seen Mitchell that day and knew that he was at the point of death. I knew that it was impossible for him to survive the day unless the Lord undertook. There are many who are let down in sickness and do not take hold of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ that is provided for them. I was taken to see a woman who was dying and said to her, How are things with you? She answered, I have faith. I believe. I said, You know that you have not faith. You know that you are dying. It is not faith that you have. It is language. There is a difference between language and faith. I saw that she was in the hands of the devil. There was no possibility of life unless he was removed from the premises. I hate the devil. And I laid hold of the woman and shouted, Come out, you devil of death! Come out in the name of Jesus! In one minute she stood on her feet in victory. But to return to the case of Brother Mitchell, I hurried down to the house, and as I got near I heard terrible screams. I knew that something had happened. I passed Mrs. Mitchell on the staircase and asked, What is up? She replied, He is gone! He is gone! I just passed her and went into the room, and immediately I saw that Mitchell had gone. I could not understand it, but I began to pray. My wife was always afraid that I would go too far, and she laid hold of me and said, Dad, don't, don't you see that he is dead? I continued to pray, and my wife continued to cry out to me, Don't, Dad, don't you see that he is dead? But I continued praying, and got as far as I could with my own faith, and then God laid hold of me. Oh, it was such a laying hold that I could believe for anything. The faith of the Lord Jesus laid hold of me, and a solid peace came into my heart. I shouted, He lives! He lives! He lives! And He is living today! There is a difference between our faith and the faith of the Lord Jesus. The faith of the Lord Jesus is needed. We must change faith from time to time. Your faith may get to a place where it wavers. The faith of Christ never wavers. When you have that faith, the thing is finished. When you have that faith, you will never look at things as they are. You will see the things of nature give way to the things of the Spirit. You will see the temporal swallowed up in the eternal. I was at a camp meeting in Casadero, California several years ago, and a remarkable thing happened. A man came there who was stone deaf. I prayed for him, and I knew that God had healed him. Then came the test. He would always move his chair up to the platform, and every time I got up to speak, he would get up as close as he could and strain his ears to catch what I had to say. The devil said, It isn't done. I declared it is done. This went on for three weeks, and then the manifestation came and he could hear distinctly sixty yards away. When his ears were opened, he thought it was so great that he had to stop the meeting and tell everybody about it. I met him in Oakland recently, and he was hearing perfectly. As we remained steadfast and unmovable on the ground of faith, 
We shall see what we believe for in perfect manifestation. People say to me, Have you not the gift of faith? I say that it is an important gift, but what is still more important is for us every moment to be making an advancement in God. Looking at the Word of God today, I find that its realities are greater to me today than they were yesterday. It is the most sublime, joyful truth that God brings an enlargement, always an enlargement. There is nothing dead, dry, or barren in this life of the Spirit. God is always moving us on to something higher, and as we move on in the Spirit, our faith will always rise to the occasion as different circumstances arise. This is how the gift of faith is manifested. You see an object, and you know that your own faith is nothing in the case. The other day, I was in San Francisco. I sat on a car and saw a boy in great agony on the street. I said, let me get out. I rushed to where the boy was. He was in agony through cramp of the stomach. I put my hands on his stomach in the name of Jesus. The boy jumped and stared at me with astonishment. He found himself instantly free. The gift of faith dared in the face of everything. It is as we are in the Spirit that the Spirit of God will operate this gift anywhere and at any time. When the Spirit of God is operating this gift within a man, he causes him to know what God is going to do. When the man with the withered hand was in the synagogue, Jesus got all the people to look to see what would happen. The gift of faith always knows the results. He said to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. His word had creative force. He was not living on the line of speculation. He spoke, and something happened. He spake at the beginning, and the world came into being. He speaks today, and these things have come to pass. He is the Son of God, and come to bring us sonship. He was the first fruit of the resurrection, and he calls us to be first fruits, to be the same kind of fruit like to himself. There is an important point here. You cannot have the gift by mere human desire. The Spirit of God distributes them severally as he will. God cannot trust some with the gift, but some who have a lowly, broken, and contrite heart he can trust. One day I was in a meeting where there were a lot of doctors and eminent men and many ministers. It was at the convention, and the power of God fell on the meeting. One humble little girl who waited tables opened her being to the Lord and was immediately filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in tongues. All these big men stretched their necks and looked up to see what was happening and were saying, Who is it? Then they learned it was the servant. Nobody received but the servant. These things are hidden and kept back from the wise and prudent. But the little children, the lowly ones, are the ones that receive. We cannot have faith if we have honor one of another. A man who is going on with God won't accept honor from his fellow beings. God honors the man of a broken, contrite spirit. How shall I get there? So many people want to do great things and to be seen doing them. But the one that God will use is the one that is willing to be hidden. My Lord Jesus never said he could do things, but he did them. When the funeral procession was coming up from Nain, with the widow's son carried upon the bier, he made them lay it down. He spoke the word, Arise! and gave the son back to the widow. He had compassion for her, and you and I will never do anything except on the line of compassion. We shall never be able to remove the cancer until we are immersed so deeply into the power of the Holy Ghost that the compassion of Christ is moving through us. I find that in all my Lord did, he said that he did not do it but that another in him did the work. What a holy submission. He was just an instrument for the glory of God. Have we reached a place where we dared to be trusted with the gift? I see in 1 Corinthians 13 that if I have faith to remove mountains and have not charity, all is a failure. When my love is so deepened in God that I only move for the glory of God, that I only seek the glory of God, then the gifts can be made manifest. God wants to be manifested and to manifest his glory to humble spirits. A faint heart can never have a gift. There are two things essential. First, love. And second, determination. A boldness of faith that will cause God to fulfill His word. When I was baptized, I had a wonderful time and had utterance in the Spirit. But for some time afterwards, I did not speak again in tongues. But one day I was helping another. The Lord again gave me utterances in the Spirit. I was one day going down the road and speaking in tongues a long while. There were some gardeners doing their work, and they stuck their heads out to see what was going on. I said, Lord, you have something new for me. You said that when a man speaks in tongues, he should ask for the interpretation. I ask for the interpretation, and I'll stay right here until I get it. And from that hour, the Lord gave me interpretation. At one time, I was in Lincolnshire, in England, and came in touch with the old pastor of an Episcopalian church. He became much interested and asked me into his library. I never heard anything sweeter than the prayer the old man uttered as he got down to pray. He began to pray, Lord, make me holy. Lord, sanctify me. 
I called out, wake up, wake up now, get up and sit in your chair. He sat up and looked at me. I said to him, I thought you were holy. He answered, yes. Then what makes you ask God to do what he has done for you? He began to laugh and then to speak in tongues. Let us move into the realm of faith and live in the realm of faith and let God have his way.